All righty, we're in verse 54. It says, he brought them to his holy realm. The mount his right hand had acquired and the, uh, the holy realm and the mount, of course, refers to Jerusalem. And understand that uh, the Jews uh, actually arriving in Jerusalem was a rather long process. Uh, the first person really to be in Jerusalem was David. That uh, the, the conquest of, uh, of Joshua was just a certain area. And uh, he got up close to Jerusalem, but uh, the, the people, the tribe in Jerusalem was called the Jebusites. And you'll hear them mentioned several times. But it was David who finally went in and actually conquered the city of Jerusalem. One of the really interesting things you watch in scripture, and it's all the way through scripture, is, is things are accomplished by increments. Like, like it's interesting that when Jesus was gathering the apostles, uh, it re records in the scripture, he had 72 followers, but he picked out 12 and, you know, worked with the 12. And when he finished working with the 12, he sent them out and said, but don't go anywhere except to the Jewish people. Don't enter a Samaritan town. So that they were dealing with smaller groups. And then with Paul, then he sent him off to the Gentiles to do the smaller groups thing. And the, the whole concept in the faith is that it's supposed to be gathered and nourished in a community, a small community. And the key to a small community is that people know one another, okay? One of the things I think you're very familiar with in the scriptures is it says very clearly in the scriptures that sin flourishes in darkness and it perishes in light. And the idea is the better that you are known, then the more, the less danger sin is to you. I like to use it like with regards to pornography. You know, when I was a kid, if you wanted to see any pornography, you had to actually go into a store, pick up a book and look at it. And hopefully you put it down before the proprietor called your mother. Okay, that was the that was that was it. But as soon as pornography became private and secretive, it's a plague. It's a plague. But as long as you can remain visible, the more of your life you can make visible to someone, the better chance that life flourishes. And, you know, we talk about that, like with regards to spiritual directors, you have a spiritual director, spiritual companion, whatever you want to call it. That's good, but that's not necessary. If you had a little group of 10 people or four people or something you're talking with who really know you, you know, and that's, that's, that's the ideal thing. So anyway, um, so he brought them in eventually into Jerusalem. He drove out nations before them, set them down in a plot of his state, and made Israel's tribes to dwell in their tents, okay? So he set up this realm, brought them in, and they dwelt in their own tents. I think it's important uh, to understand the concept of tent when you're writing about it at this point. People actually lived in tents. And uh, if any of you have like to been to Morocco, you've probably been in a Bedouin tent. If you've been to Israel, there's a chance you've been in a Bedouin tent. I think, you know, the Bedouins tend to be Muslim so that there's the, the division. But a Bedouin tent is in fact a palace. They're, they're big black tents on the outside because they're woven from uh, goat's hair. Goat's hair is really, stiff and when you weave it it's waterproof so they they have the tents made out of this but inside the tent is persian carpets that sits against that highly decorated they have chandeliers hanging it's i mean they're really beautiful inside and so that that's how, how, how they were living 
It used to be when I was a youngster reading Tent, I thought it was two Boy Scouts in a field, you know, but it's, it's not quite the way it worked. It says, yet they tried God the Most High and rebelled, and his precepts they did not keep. Now, notice this pattern. He freed them from Egypt, and they complained. He brought them into the Holy Land. They ignored him. That always the action is first on God, and the reaction is against it. And we will watch this consistently in their history. They fell back and betrayed like their parents, whipped around like an untrusty bow. Okay, and the untrusty bow, the bow for the, uh, uh, what do you call it, for arrows. Um, the, the interesting thing is it, it took them a while to sort of develop um, uh, how, to, how to make a good one and this sort of thing. But if they had an untrusty bow, uh, it, would, it would simply be used for something else in the house. It, it couldn't be used, you know, for, for arrows. So they vexed him with their high places, incensed him with their idols. And, and the idea is once they settled down, they began to pick up the religion of the locals. And it's, it, I think that that's a difficult thing for Israel. Israel came very early to the concept of there being one God. Now, it wasn't immediate because you'll oftentimes notice in the Psalms references to God of gods. Well, that must mean there are other gods or the greatest among the gods must mean there are other gods. So early in the history of Israel, they thought their God was the best of the gods, but they thought there were other gods. But very early, they came to the concept there was only one God. But the interesting thing is that when you begin to move into the pagan areas, their gods are specialized. So like if you go into an area that is agriculture, they would have a god who had nothing to do but to deal with agriculture. And so that god would deal with all kinds of things with regards to agriculture. Go ahead. Pardon? I will do that. Okay. So they uh, this this I, the idea of the gods being uh, what do you call it specialized. It, it was very easy as a Jew to realize that God controlled the heavens and did all these things, everything. And agriculture was one of the things he did. But what about this guy over here who just does agriculture? He doesn't need to be bothered with all that junk. So they would end up with temples to these gods. Now, one of the key things about the worship of God is the worship of God. We always think of God as being up there. And so they worship in on high places. And where you had no high places, like Egypt or Mexico, you built pyramids so that you could get up closer to God. Or if you're building a Catholic church, you put up a tower, okay? But you find a way to get closer to God because God is up and hell is down, okay? For me, God is in Las Vegas and hell is in Washington, but it just depends on, it's, it, it's just how you view it, I, you know. It's just, it, it. So, God heard and was angry and he rejected Israel. And this, this idea of God rejecting Israel, again, you know, God's incapable of rejecting, but he, he punishes, he punishes, but he doesn't reject them. He abandoned the sanctuary of Shiloh, the tent where he dwelt among them. Shiloh was where the first temple was built. And I don't know if you know the history of it, but the, the ruins of that building are still there. And so they, they did the measurements on the building. And if you remember in the Exodus, God gave the exact measurements for the thing. And this building of Shiloh um, is larger, slightly larger 
than the dimensions that God told them to use for a temple. And they have since worked out from Jewish writings that what the Jews did was build this building around their tent. Okay, so they, they didn't destroy the tent that God had ordered them to build. They just built their temple around it. So it built a, a little larger. And, uh, and Shiloh, again, is a variant of the word Shalom. So that their capital at that time was Shiloh. And then their next capital would be Yerushalem. Okay, that, so the, the idea is their capital is always peace. And uh, so they, he abandoned the sanctuary, the tent where he dwelt among them. He let, he, he let his might become captive and gave his splendor to the hand of the foe. And what he's talking about here is the invasions like Babylon, where the Jews were uh, enslaved. And, and the idea here is God's basically saying, if, if you don't want my leadership, then there are other people who are delighted to be in charge of you. And so you, the choice is yours. But it, it's just like, uh, I, f I forget the, one of, uh, there was a song years ago about everybody serves somebody. And this, this idea that God's saying that that's true, you can choose to serve me, but you can't choose not to serve anybody. That can't be done. Everybody serves somebody. He go, gave over his people to the sword and it, against his estate, he enraged. And the thing I'd like you to notice here is the reference to his estate, because in the beginning, he said he gave them the estate, but our estate is God's estate. And so God defends us because we're his people. God defends his land because our estate is his estate. And our relationship with God, and this is what is celebrated if the book, The Song of Songs, if you're familiar with it. But our relationship with God is like a marriage. And so when we talk about the universe, that's a wonderful thing to think of. I, I oftentimes have this go through my mind. When you look at that photographs from the new uh, uh, telescope, they show these beautiful things of the universe. I think to myself, community property. God and I, we got it, you know. But this whole idea of it is, in fact, a, a, a relationship that bonds us together, that, that whatever I have belongs to God. But the significant thing is that whatever God has belongs to me. That's the relationship he's chosen. He says, the young men, the fire consumed, the virgins, no wedding song knew. The priests fell to the sword. That's distressing. Um, and his widows did not, were not kept. The master awoke as one sleeping like a warrior shaking off wine. And, and what they're talking about here is that you have the impression that God isn't paying any attention, that God's doing something else. You know, remember the story of the prophet with the gods? He says that maybe he's busy, maybe. Maybe he's off on a journey. Maybe he's asleep. You know, this idea of trying to get God's attention. But God is never that way. The, I, I, again, I think God is all about tomorrow. And, um, you know, in the, um, in the name Yahweh, uh, they always translate it, I am who am. A correct translation of that could be, I am who I was which I wouldn't particularly like, or I am who I will be. It could be either way. And I think what God is telling us in his name is you only discover me by living your life. I am who I will be to you, okay? And my personal opinion, again, is that God is different person to each one who walks the face of the earth. He's not the same to everybody. And one of the great things of heaven is if you want to know all about God, you're going to have to talk to everyone there, okay? You have to meet them because you hold something of God 
that no other person who ever walks the face of the earth holds. And if they want to know that about God, they need to talk to you. Okay, that's why it's important that people are saved. It's because this this knowledge of God is distributed. It says, and he beat back his foes, everlasting disgrace he gave them. So it appears he wakes up. As soon as he wakes up, then the enemies are swept back again. And the uh, the the idea of uh, I I think probably the most famous example of this is. Uh, one of the sieges of Jerusalem, and I forget which one it was, but they gathered around Jerusalem and they they put an army around so that they couldn't get food in or out or anything and, and besieged Jerusalem with a very strong army. And the Jews were praying to God that they would find a way to somehow uh, survive this. And uh, one morning, all the beggars in the town were screaming. So they thought they had you know, broken in, and they went out and they found the army surrounding Jerusalem dead. And what they presume, I think you know that flus are indigenous to an area, and they become, they. if you're raised in the area where the flu always is, you tend to get used to it uh, physically. But if you pick up a flu from the other area, like the Asian flu or the uh, the flu that came from Spain. As if you pick up a flu from another area, it can be fatal. And the the concept concept is that they probably picked up the local flu when they came in, and they were dead. And the reason the beggars were screaming is because they were getting all the beggars together go out and loot the dead bodies. Okay, so so that's what they were doing. But they were they were deathly afraid. They got up and found out that their enemy was dead, died during the night. So he rejected the tent of Joseph, the tribe of Ephraim he did not choose, and he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion that he loves. The largest of all the tribes was the tribe of Judah. And the other tribes were pretty well the same in size, with the exception of one that was very tiny, which is the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin was the smallest tribe, and they were so small that their land actually was enclosed by the land of Judah as the lands were divided up. Judah went clear around it. And the very first king of Israel was Saul, and he was selected from the tribe of Benjamin. And the reason why he was selected from the tribe of Benjamin, my opinion, the Jews would have nothing to fear about the tribe of Benjamin taking over because it was such a small tribe. So an ideal one for the king to come from. Then once the whole thing was organized, then the king came out of Judah, the tribe to which kingship had been promised way back. But at the, at the death of uh, Jacob, he pronounced Judah as being the source of the out of the tribe of Judah will rise the one who will govern my people. But the, he sets up that tribe. But it had to go through a smaller tribe first so that the people were not threatened. But eventually he the, chose the tribe of Judah. And for us, the choice of the tribe of Judah is actually the choice of Jesus because that's the tribe that Jesus comes down in uh, with, uh, what do you call it, uh, Joseph, that he's down that line. He says, and he built on the heights his sanctuary, like the earth he founded forever. And so th this idea of the sanctuary of God being as permanent as th the very earth that God creates, it, it's interesting because you and I, when we look historically, we see the temple conquered and destroyed, conquered and destroyed twice and then renovated once by Herod. But we, we watch the temple go through these phases. But actually, when we get to the Christian scriptures, we found out that the true temple of God is in the heart of a believer. And that's permanent. They went to their deaths as martyrs for that, both Jews and Christians, that the, the real temple of God is the heart of any believer. And that is permanent. 
He chose David his servant and took him out, took him out from the sheepfolds. And uh, two things about him coming out of the sheepfolds is that David understood kingship the way he understood sheep. You lead them, you don't drive them. They know your name, they know you. This David was uh, an amazing king. He's one of the very few kings at that time in history who died. Most of them were murdered by sons when they were ready to take over. David had a couple of sons who tried that, but David died, you know. And this idea, the second thing that, that came from David, I think you know that many of the Psalms were written by David. So the second thing that came from David, David is the one who brought music into the liturgy. Because David, uh, I presume, uh, for whatever reason, uh, David, when he led his sheep, sang. He had, uh, uh, what do you call it, a kind of a miniature harp. And he would play this thing and sing. And that's how the sheep followed him. He didn't, you know, die to give them a sermon. But no, he, 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 uh, he would sing. And so, and so they followed him. But then when he came into the temple and he became king, he brought that music into the temple. And when he brought, that's the beginning of music in liturgy, okay, in our tradition. Um, from the nursing ewes, he brought them to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his estate. And the other thing to remember about uh, David is uh, this thing about David being, I think you, you remember the story, uh, Jesse is David's father. And so uh, Samuel was told that one of Jesse's sons was supposed to be um, uh, king of Israel. So they put the youngest son in charge of the sheep, which is David, and the rest of them all go. And as they're brought forward to Saul, they go through these beautiful descriptions of each son, you know, and magnificent descriptions, and then reject them, reject them, reject them. And then he says, do you have any other sons as well? You know, the kids at home watching the sheep. So he says, well, I told you to bring your sons. So they bring him in. One of the things I love in the scriptures, they've run out of adjectives. So they say he's ruddy. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, so he comes forward and uh, they, uh, and then he's selected king. But notice that God selected the least significant in the eyes of everyone, this David, and made him the greatest king in the whole history of Israel. And by great, I mean he was a good king, you know, as far as, as the way he led the, the country and everything. He says, with his heart's innocence, he shepherded them with skilled lambs, he guided, skilled hands, he guided them. What does he mean about a shepherd's innocence? Was he was raised to be a shepherd, not to be a king? I don't know. I don't know if you've ever heard this story, uh, where Virgin Airlines got their name. The people who got together to form it had never had anything to do with any airline, so they called it Virgin Airlines because they didn't know anything about the stuff. You know, they were businessmen but they didn't know anything about aviation. And this, the whole thing, David didn't know anything about being a king, but he knew how to be a shepherd, which really qualified him, you know? And I, I think we, uh, when I was first came to this diocese, we had uh, a bishop, the bishop's name was Harry Clinch. And Harry Clinch uh, had been a priest in, uh, um, hmm, it's uh, it's in the Diocese of Fresno now anyway, but and uh, a rather a nice guy, but the, I think that's what you would about say about him. But uh, he had done a lot for the Italian Catholic Federation, and uh, the Italian Catholic Federation really loved him. And something to know about the Italian Catholic Federation, they have relatives in Rome, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, when a bishop was appointed to be the auxiliary to uh, the bishop in Fresno, um, Rome appointed uh, Harry Clinch to everyone's surprise, 
including Harry Clinch. Okay. This was, this was, it's just, I would love to have seen the face of the bishop in San Diego when he was appointed the cardinal. That would have been wonderful. I'm sure we'll have a movie of it at Last Judgment, but I'd love to just see it now. The, uh, but anyway, the, uh, the thing is, Harry Clinch was used to being a pastor. So when he came into this diocese, he didn't bishop, he pastored. And he was magnificent. He was just wonderful. He thought he was unqualified. So he got other people to do everything. Like when I was involved in the site, the charismatic renewal, he wrote 11 letters to the group, the charismatic renewal in the diocese while I was there. I wrote all of them. You know, he wrote a bunch of letters on liturgy and those were written by uh, John Griffin and uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Matthew Pennington. But you, you watch these, like he felt so unqualified, he did the best for the diocese. And so that's what God did. God looked at someone who thought he himself was unqualified. And God says, this guy's going to be so helpless, he'll let me do something. And that's exactly what happened. Magnificent man. Just amazing. They should more often surprise people, I think, with, with offices. Anyway. Uh, 79, next Psalm. We actually finished that one finally. You'll probably get extra credit for that at Last Judgment. And so, so this next one also is one of the Asked Psalms. And it says, God, nations have come into your presence, into your estate. They have defiled your holy temple. They have turned Jerusalem into ruins. This is a song, a psalm. This is appealing to God for deliverance, okay? So notice that now they speak of it as God's estate, okay? And the the idea in, you find this all the time in, in scripture with regards to prayer. God, you need to bless me because everyone knows you are my God. If you don't bless me, they won't think you're a very good God. So you need to bless me. It's not for me, of course, but you need to bless me. And you need to build your temple gloriously so that everyone will know who you are as God. Not for us, I mean. But and the, consistently, it'll go through this in Scripture, okay? Which isn't a bad way to pray, I might point out, okay? So uh, he says, they have given your servants corpses as food to the fowl of the heavens and the flesh of your faithful to the beasts of the earth, uh, largely because of the influence of the Egyptians. And remember that they had been slaves in Egypt over a period of time, but largely through the influence of the Egyptians, the care of the dead had become a very significant thing. And that spread a lot through the Middle East, largely again, under the Egyptian influence. Now the Jews never had this, you know, great embalming process or anything, but they, it was considered a catastrophe if your uh, corpse were to lay out in the desert and be eaten by vultures or something like that. They considered it a, a catastrophe, but that's all a legacy from Egypt, okay? All a legacy from Egypt. I was telling someone, uh, I think yesterday in a car, that uh, we believe, you know, in the resurrection of the body and that we all get our bodies back at the resurrection. And uh, I was talking to this uh, guy who's uh, a scientist, actually. And uh, he, said, I, I, he said, I just can't believe the idea of getting bodies back because bodies are recycled. And he says that your body goes into the earth. It becomes a part of another body and this sort of thing. And he says, he says, I, I think it'd be possible to re, redo this with the bodies. And we were at his home. And, I, and uh, so I went out and I said, look at the stars. He was looking up. I said, you think the guy who did that can't put a body together? You know, I don't know how he'll do it, but I have no doubt he can. So this idea of the bodies uh, being out there is... Uh, uh, something that they would see as terrible. They have spilled their blood like water all around Jerusalem. There's no one to bury them. And that's uh, even after the 
the people leave, there's so many bodies, there's nothing that can be done. I think you know that happened in several places in the world uh, during the pandemic, that there were so many people dying that they could, um, I, if I'm correct, I think it's, you can't possibly catch that disease from a dead body. But oftentimes when a person dies, you know that it's possible to get what they have even from the dead body. So you have to be really careful about these diseases and plagues and things. So he says, we have become a disgrace to our neighbors, scorn and contempt to all around us. In other words, people no longer see our importance. How long, O oh Lord, will you rage forever? Will your fury burn like fire? And, and basically at this point, they've come to the realization that God punishes and doesn't destroy. But the question is, how long does the punishment go on? Okay, how long do you need it? One of the things I, I most remember about my father, my father, um, we, were, we were raised with um, punishment that was swift and corporeal. And the thing is that my father, if he did something wrong, he would punish you, but it would be like instantaneous. Like for instance, if, if we were going to uh, a store to get an ice cream and uh, I were to punch my sister as one usually does when walking with one's younger sister. I mean, it's genetic, I think. But anyway, so, uh, and I would punch my sister and my, my father would immediately discipline me and say something about it but then we'd go on and get the ice cream. And if you had watched us in the ice cream store, you never could have known which one he'd punished. He, would, he had this amazing ability to do it and it's over. And that's, that's always been my concept of God, that it's punish it done. You know, it's just, just finished that way. But the idea is that they're looking now and how long does this go on? Pour out your wrath on the nations that did not know you on your kingdoms that did not call on your name. And this idea of, you know, I've, I've spoken at, uh, oh, probably 30 or 40 Holocaust commemorations. And I always speak on the same thing, that one of the difficulties with the Jews when they look back at the Holocaust is they condemn people for uh, they didn't do enough. Like they'll look at, at people that uh, Schindler, he saved this many, but he could have saved this many more and this sort of thing. And one of the things I tell them is you really need to condemn the people who did nothing, not the people who tried. Because when you look back, everyone could have done more. You would always see that in everything. But I think people tried to the best of their ability and stuff like that. There's a book about this out, incidentally, that... They've released the uh, private papers of Pius XII. They were able to release them after his uh, uh, 50 years. You can't release them for 50 years. And how many of you saw the movie Volcari with Tom Cruise about the Nazis? Pius XII was the one who engineered that. And this book reveals it from his papers. He, he had four plots against Hitler's life take place. And they figure now today that Pius XII was responsible singularly for the survival of 800,000 Jews because of the ones he hid in the things. And they say he is responsible for saving more Jews than all the other people put together. And But what Pius XII did was did it secretly. And he maintained, you know, he sent a uh, birthday card to Hitler every year, but he, he maintained it and was able to, uh, to accomplish this simply by, by how he bent about it. He wrote a letter at one time, it was read in the seminaries, I don't think it was publicly, but one of the lines in the letter is very important. He says, sometimes in order to do good, you need to give up the appearance of good. So that, you know, you, you can choose to look good or sometimes maybe it's better just to hide that and do good. Doing good's first. If you can look good, so much the better. 
but do good. He says, for they have devoured Jacob and his habitation laid waste. Do not call against us our ancestors' crimes. So he's saying, look at everything they've done, but simultaneously don't remember what we did, okay? Look at what they've done, punish them, this sort of thing, but don't look back at what we did, okay? Um, he says, quickly, may your mercies overtake us, for we have sunk very low. And this quickly, I, I think one of the, the basic virtues that God uses in dealing with us is patience. And the primary virtue that God demands of us in relationship to him is patience, that we really stand in patience. Uh, Leonard Bernstein composed uh, a mass to commemorate uh, the death of Kennedy. It was the first performed in the opening of the Kennedy Center in uh, Washington, DC. But uh, one of the things he did, remember he's a Jew, so the liturgy of the word is the strongest part of the service. But what he, he did, he, it, it, I find it amazing. He took the creed and he composed what called an anti-creed. And first of all, the, the celebrant begins with, I believe in God. And then the anti-creed begins. I forget how the anti-creed goes, but the chorus in the anti-creed is, I'll believe in one God, I'll believe in three. I'll believe in any God who believes in me. And, and they go through the thing that way. But when they get to the idea of they come again in glory at the end of time, they launch into, well, look how rotten the world is. Do you really think it's going to get any worse? It's about time you come, you know? And they go through this thing. And I, I think we, we all look at that, you know? You look at the world and figure... I don't really believe it could get much worse. You know, it's hard to imagine. And and yet, you know, I, I, I really think it's a good time to come. What can I say? You know, I think it'd be delightful today. We could throw a party. We'd be ready for him. You know, I'm fall for that. And we, we even have cookies. <laughs> so anyway, he says, uh, the, the other thing I'd like to mention about this, that we talk about God's patience in dealing with us, and we're called to patience in God. Remember in Paul, patience is the very first definition of love. Love is patient. Love is kind, you know. The very first definition of love is patience. That's why God is patient with us. And that's why he insists we be patient with him. The primary virtue of love is patience. And I would tell you, it, impatience is the most frequently mentioned sin in the confessional. Okay, I don't know when children learn about it so early, but they, it is the most frequently confessed sin, and all are guilty. Okay, he says, Help us, our rescuing God, for your name's sake. Okay, you see, they call him rescuing God, so help us for your name's sake, that you're known as a rescuing God. Now prove it. Okay, this is this is who you are. Save us and atone for our sins for the sake of your name. And this verse could almost be considered prophetic because in the Jewish tradition, we definitely expect the forgiveness of God, but we never think in terms of atonement. And in Jesus, we see atonement. Atonement is really a Jesus thing. God the Father, in a sense, never suffered for us. Okay, God the Father forgives us and this sort of thing. But Jesus came among us, compassion, and then suffered with us, and then suffered for us. He says, why should the nations say, where is their God? Let it be known among the nations before our eyes, the vengeance for your servants spilled blood. And the, the tragedy here is that they want God to prove he's God by killing their enemies. And that it goes about that. I'll tell you, in, in my own life, my experience is uh, oftentimes, uh, I think in, in times of extreme difficulty, uh, while I probably have not actually formulated it that way, definitely in my heart, I wanted the enemies to drop dead. 
I've never been vicious and want to see them suffer. I just want to see them gone. So the, uh, the, the idea of thinking of that, but I will tell you in my life, God has never destroyed any one of my enemies, but he has consistently destroyed enmity. So that people I was at odds with, if I didn't correct it, ultimately they did. And I watched that go on in my life. There are people who I just did not have the courage to correct it, but then they did. So in my life, enmity has always perished. And I think that's the whole thing about, you know, the destruction of enemies. Now pray for the destruction of enmity, okay? If you destroy enmity, no one has to die, okay? You destroy the enmity, you don't need to kill either of the participants. He says, let the captives groan come before you. By your arms greatness, unbind those marked out for blood. And this, this captive groans come before you is a, is a very, very typical way of this idea that, that does God realize how bad it is, this sort of thing. You see these, these ads on TV so that um, if you're, you know, St. Jude's Hospital will show you the difficulty of the, the person, to uh, the Shriners do the same thing. And I saw a thing on TV the other day for that uh, ship, is it called City of Hope, whatever it is, and they show you the children with the problems that those doctors are able to solve. You know, it's just, it, it's funny that um, if, if you were to look at Mexico, the most serious thing that they could use in Mexico medically is the most frivolous thing that we have in the United States. And it is plastic surgery. And one of the reasons is so many children there are injured in uh, fires and things like that in ways that make society kind of reject them. And it's because the society they live in, the, they don't have the protections against children falling into a fire. You know, if, if, if I was around a child fall, fell into a fire, you know, that I'd, I'd hand them a lawyer's card immediately, you know. But this idea that we have all kinds of ways of dealing with it in our society, but not theirs. And plastic surgery isn't necessarily a, a very complicated or, or process. And we use it cosmetically, you know. But those people really should be working in Mexico, okay? Anyway, uh, we'll pick it up here at verse 12 of uh, Psalm 79 when we come back. Thank you. <laughs> 